All right, Ken Lock is in. All right, so let me click. All right. Hold on, let me make sure it's right. Yeah, you must have had another meeting for now I can get in. All right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You know, this is, I feel like we all have to be tech savvy. <laughs> it's not, it's not the colony club where, you know, I got Duane and everybody walking on this. So <laughs> I have to be the technician. We know, we know. And the moderator, you know, and this morning, nobody else is giving welcome remarks but me. So. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Good, Bankley. How are you? Good, good, good. All is well? You know, we're hanging in. I hope you are, too. Uh, yeah, same here. It's, it's just, um, you know, it's a different day and time. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the second time I get to do a panel with my friend Cindy Paskey this week. So, I mean, it must be a good week. Nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you get to see those boxes behind me one more time, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jerry, how are you? Good, Jeff. How you doing? I'm actually Good. at our uh, Trombley uh, Service Center today. Oh, are you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. We're going to right. actually do our community meeting from here today. Nice. Yeah. Pastor Kinlock, how are you? I'm all right. How are you? Good, thank you. Cindy, I see Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hey, Pastor, how are you? I'm all right today. How are things going for you? Good, good. I was just talking about uh, Detroit Promise. Yes. Yesterday, so appreciate all you're doing there. All right. Well, we'll um, <clears throat> we've got we've have we have a lot of people who are signed up for this as well, and um, we're going to be live streaming it on the Pulse Institute Facebook page as well as uh, Triumph Church Facebook page as well, and as well as my uh, own personal Facebook page. We're going to uh, we're going to saturate, I guess, uh, the social networking site with this information. I think this is a timely uh, conversation that is um, needed. And uh, we'll start shortly, uh, but maybe just a quick uh, housekeeping rules. What I want to do with this is the first 25 minutes, ask you questions just about where we are with COVID and what you all are doing individually as far as your entities are concerned. And then we'll move into uh, questions. We'll take questions. I mean, audience members here can raise their hand or they can shoot me a chat message uh, in the um, in the link in the uh, uh, participant section and we can uh, take questions from them as well. Thank you. Well, let me begin and say uh, thank you all once again for uh, being here and uh, for accepting uh, the Pulse Institute invitation to this uh, CEO Forum on Poverty series. Uh, those who have been following the Pulse Institute, this is part of an ongoing series that we've been doing the last two years because um, as an anti-poverty, non-partisan, independent, anti-poverty think tank, we feel that it is necessary not only to crusade against poverty from the bottom up, from the bottom, but also to really raise this issue to what I call on, in unlikely places. Uh, places where you won't hear this kind of conversation, uh, places where you don't normally, people don't go into meetings and the subject or the menu in, the, in, you know, in that meeting room is about poverty. And we feel that it is necessary for the Institute to drive this conversation uh, to these places. And I think what better way uh, to, really, to really begin to, 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 to see what is happening at the highest levels of, of the economic ladder than to have 
industry captains, uh, significant business and political leaders in this conversation. So in the past, we've, we've presented, uh, you know, had a myriad of, of leaders from our university presidents, uh, you name it, uh, to the Attorney General of the State of Michigan, Dana Nassau, to uh, the C of Wayne County, Warren Evans, and all of them have, you know, Grace's platform, uh, uh, the C of Forum Series. In fact, we have two returning participants here, uh, Cindy Paskey, uh, they would soon become an alumni of this forum series. Cindy Paskey, the president and CEO of Strategic Staffing Solutions, and uh, Jeff, uh, uh, not Jeff, <laughs> Jerry Nosia. <laughs> Jerry Nosia, the president and CEO of DT Energy. When Jerry came on board uh, on this panel, he was then the president and chief operating officer, which was two years ago, but he has since been pro promoted to uh, being the number one guy at DT Energy. So, lots of, so we've, we've done this uh, really. Um, you know, uh, to, 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 the, to the extent of getting uh, folks from different industry. And I think it's just significant to be able to engage. Uh, I believe in as much as uh, some of us are raising hell and crusading, whether it's in the streets, whether it's in newspapers, whether it's on the radio, we might as, we must still continue to engage uh, those at the highest levels of, of the economic uh, spectrum. And, and that's what uh, this uh, forum series about, and there's no better topic than COVID-19 in itself, which uh, is really has ravaged uh, many communities. In fact, as we were preparing uh, for this forum, I was reading a report that came out uh, indicating CDC report uh, that uh, Black and Latino kids have been, in fact, among the most affected uh, by COVID-19. Suddenly, Detroit being the largest Black city in the nation uh, it is no stranger. In fact, it's been one of the epicenters. And all of you in here do have a role. Uh, you are industrial leaders. You are significant leaders in this town. You are stakeholders in this town. And I think uh, we ought to have this conversation about how this has exacerbated the poverty crisis and what are we doing now, what you are doing now from your perspective and from your institutional point of view uh, to, to, really, to really get this going. So um, we're going to kick off um, this. We're going to start uh, the meeting now. And um, again, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming and certainly for uh, being a part, a part of this uh, conversation here. I'm going to, um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, earlier in my email to all of you, and that is, and that is that uh, I want all of you to give kind of an opening, if you will, um, you know, kind of remark about the subject matter and where we are. Uh, let me start with um, Jeff Donnerfield, uh, director of the Michigan um, uh, Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Sure. Uh, Binkley, thank you very much for having this forum. Um, you know, I'm honored to be on it with uh, such esteemed uh, colleagues, uh, both in Detroit and uh, across Michigan, and, and certainly um, on this very important topic. You know, we are laser focused, and uh, the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, which is about a year old, um, has been focused on economic inequality, on trying to, to expand our definition of poverty, not just from those who fall under the federal rate, but of course those who fall under the ALICE rate, that asset limited income constrained employed, the individuals who are working but still not able to meet um, their, uh, their quality of life or the standards of living to uh, meet just household budgets. Um, and despite 10 years of economic growth, of course, we saw that there were quite a few of those folks. In Michigan, 43% of households fell under the ALICE rate, um, even before the economic crisis that we find ourselves in with, with COVID. In Detroit, that number was 74% of households. So much of our work and much of the work that uh, we've been doing over the last year has been focused on that. But in COVID, in this unprecedented time, um, of course, we've had to pivot. Um, it has really made things uh, so much worse. And what I would say is, is you know, in, in a, any number of ways, uh, there are measures that we say, um, you know, need to be uh, addressed. We know that there are, are gaps and there were gaps for housing, jobs, um, for helping those who are returning citizens, for helping those who have childcare obligations. Um, and, you know, it's only gotten worse during this crisis. So during the crisis, we've done a couple things. We've re really tried to prioritize getting emergency funds to those who need it the most, particularly through unemployment insurance uh, agency and, and the various benefits 
uh, that we've paid out. We've paid out $22 billion so far throughout the state of Michigan. Just to give you some comparison, we've had more claims in the last um, six months than we had in the last six years combined. Um, in the city of Detroit and in Wayne County, we paid about 15, or excuse me, five billion in benefits to more than 600,000 workers. Um, those are really critical because those benefits are keeping food on the table. They're making sure that people can buy medicine, that they're not gonna lose their home. We've done other things too, like uh, put an eviction um, and uh, tax foreclosure moratorium in place. Uh, we put $50 million into an eviction diversion program. We've tried to help small businesses, particularly those small businesses on Main Street who are just starting out, um, who you know, are, are really gonna be struggling with cash flow. We've given out $110 million in grants and loans. Uh, we've helped people connect with the uh, Federal uh, Stimulus Act dollars. And we've made sure that we also aren't leaving other people behind. Um, we've put $7 million into the Homeless Action Network here in Detroit. We've made sure that Detroiters in the front lines of this crisis, um, the essential workers that are out there keeping our communities safe, we're making sure that they have uh, you know, protections. Um, we've developed rules on various industries uh, to you know, allow for both uh, safe um, job security uh, so that if you, uh, are, you come down with COVID, if you uh, have a family member who come down, comes down with COVID, that you have some ability to pull down income and that an employer can't discriminate you, against you for that. But also that we are keeping you safe on the job. Um, and so we have MyOSHA inspectors out every day. We've launched an ambassador program to help employers understand the best practices and rules so that those individuals on the front line helping serve our communities are, are gonna be safe. Um, and those individuals on the front lines too, we wanna reward, we wanna thank because they're our heroes and so many Detroiters fall into that category. We launched the Future for Frontliners program uh, just last week. Um, the governor announced that uh, in a press conference and we had just a huge outpouring of interest and support. This is a program that if you worked on the front lines during the second quarter of this year, um, if you were helping us uh, keep electricity, keep up, um, you know, water flowing, if you were helping make sure that a hospital could operate um, or that uh, we were getting our groceries at uh, the grocery store, you're eligible for a tuition-free path to a college degree or certificate. You're also eligible, if you don't have your high school diploma, we've got your back on that too. We wanna help you complete, we wanna help you get a certificate at the same time. And that's very much because education and economic opportunity are linked. Uh, and we want to give pathways to as many people as possible and make that easier uh, for as many of our frontliners out there who've been really saving lives in their own way. Um, we also want to make sure that there are uh, opportunities to help business, though, grow. And by filling the talent gap, by making sure that we have the most qualified workforce in uh, both the country, but uh, in the Detroit region and Detroit itself, uh, we're going to continue to help businesses locate in our communities, create those good paying jobs and provide pathways um, out of poverty and out of the Alice rate. So Bankley, thank you again for everything you're doing here. Uh, and I'll throw it back to you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff Donofio, uh, Executive Director of the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Let me head to uh, Jerry Nosia, President and CEO of DT Energy for your opening comments. Well, good morning, Bank Lane. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to see some of you and speak to many of you. So I, uh, the way we organized ourselves during the pandemic, Bank Lane, was to really in, in three categories. Um, you know, obviously, we're a firm uh, that exists because we serve uh, customers with very essential products, you know, electricity and natural gas for home heating and hot water heating. And so our first priority was to make sure that we could continue to serve. And that this pandemic really started, to, you know, became a threat to that um, uh, or became a possibility to interrupt service if it started to uh, hurt a lot of our employees. So the first thing that we did is we sprang into action and really uh, went to great extents to protect our employees and protect our workforce. So that meant um, securing proper PPE early, much earlier than many others. And I'll talk a little more about that. And uh, also adopting safe um, uh, social distancing practices and hygiene and so on and so forth. So we, we sprang into action immediately. We treated this like a new hazard. So you can imagine DTE deals with a lot of hazards, right? High voltage electricity, which can be a hazard to our employees. And we're well trained on how to deal with life-threatening hazards. Natural gas can be a life hazard. So we, we are a company that manages uh, extreme hazards. So this we view this as a night, another life hazard 
for our employees. And so develop processes, procedures, and PPE requirements in order to protect our employees, first and foremost. And the reason for that was that we needed to really secure our, our ability to continue to serve uh, an essential service. Once we had that, uh, and that came pretty quickly, you know, we're talking days and hours here as things were moving quickly. And, all, and we were also one of the first utilities to suspend all non-essential work. So we took as many of our field workers out of the field so we didn't put them in this way, in the way of an overwhelming force such as the pandemic and put them in harm's way unnecessarily. Then we sprang into action for our customers. And we knew that our customers were gonna to start to feel crisis um, as it relates to uh, low income customers, especially our most vulnerable customers, our seniors and our low income customers. And uh, what we did is we worked with the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Michigan Public Service Commission to streamline processes to get federal aid and state aid for energy assistance into their hands in days versus months, okay? So that created a huge opportunity to stabilize our low income and senior citizens uh, from, uh, in terms of being able to continue to have, receive service from us. Then the other thing we did is we uh, also donated $10 million to nonprofit agencies such as Thaw United Way that uh, deliver energy assistance to our most uh, vulnerable customers. Uh, the third thing we did is we reduced our rates by $40 million in July and August, because those are the peak usage months. And we mm -hmm. wanted to blunt uh, the, you know, the extreme heat that we knew was starting to envelope our region so that we could reduce bills in those uh, peak usage months. And then the last thing we did was we froze our rates for all of next year on the, on the electric, for the electric business so that we would not put more incremental economic pressure um, on our customers. So we took some pretty unique and creative measures and we were able to do that because we also went after our own cost structure to respond uh, to this crisis. So that's how we were able to do all of these things. So that's it, as it relates to customers. Then community, you know, and all of these things happened uh, concurrently. You know, we saw this massive need uh, develop for PPE, um, for hospitals, police stations, fire stations. And uh, what we did is we secured 2 million masks uh, for hospital systems, police stations and fire stations and delivered them um, uh, to the hospitals, local hospitals here in Detroit and Metro Detroit area, as well as uh, police stations, uh, for example, in Detroit. I, you know, one Saturday afternoon, I was on the phone with uh, Mayor Duggan and uh, we were making arrangements to have our trucks uh, pick up masks and deliver them, deliver them to police stations. So that's the big deal. We did is we uh, did not cancel our summer youth employment program. Many corporations, because of the pandemic, walked away from their summer youth employment program. Well, we got creative. You know, we did a lot of uh, online work and uh, still employed 1,500 students uh, through that process. So that was a huge benefit uh, to the community. Um, then uh, another initiative that we undertook was Connected Futures, uh, where we saw this crisis emerging. Uh, around children of Detroit, uh, only 10% of the DPS students have access to uh, electronic devices to do their schoolwork. And when the governor uh, was on the verge of canceling school for the summer, uh, we sprang into action as DT, along with many other partners, to put together a program to purchase and deliver 51,000 electronic devices to students um, you know, across the city of Detroit in the Detroit public school system. And now we're also working to broaden that to charters. And we got about 38,000 or 37 or 38,000 of those tablets distributed. And we had no idea that in the fall, how important this would be with many children having to do their work on, on a virtual basis. So those are the big things that we uh, worked on Bank of Light uh, in, those three, in those three categories, our employees, our customers, and our community. And we feel that when we do things when we're a force for good in all three of those areas we end up with a very successful company and i would i'm happy to say that uh, because of that i think all of that is paying forward for us and uh, we continue to be a successful company uh, in the city of detroit all right uh cindy Pasky, president and c president and ceo of strategic staffing solutions thank you lane good morning everyone um and good morning. 
Good morning to my fellow panelists. It's um, great to share this forum with you. Um, I think we should all be very thankful that um, we have Jeff Donofrio up in Lansing um, looking at the world through his lens, which is really very similar to all of ours. Um, and um, so kudos to you, Jeff, for, for remembering who we really need to serve and finding a way to help navigate through that and, and uh, an entity like Lansing. Um, you know, for S3, uh, we're an essential business and all of our customers um, are essential industries. And um, so we never stopped working. We, uh, we uh, never stopped coming into the offices in a smaller group because we needed to. Um, and we really, we focused on three things. As you know, our org charts an upside down triangle. It has customers, consultants, and community at the top. Um, from, a, from a consultant standpoint, it was to get them home as soon as possible. Um, and you know, we just had moved into the space I'm sitting in, which is a 400 seat development center. Um, the last week in February, we had 400 consultants in their brand new space, and I sent them home March 6th. And everybody was like, why are you sending them home? And I'm like, well, you know, we do a lot of business in Europe and in the UK, and we've been watching this, and I want, we want everybody home. Um, and then we worked with our customers to get our consultants um, deployed all around the world as home as quickly as we could. On, um, and then we really focused on keeping people working um, and creating jobs. And we created what we called our internal S3 jobs report that we shared with our team twice a month around the world. And um, in, uh, as of the end of July, we had created 1,600 new jobs and put people to work. It was the thing that we thought we could do the best, which was keep people in their jobs and get people that needed jobs into them. From a community standpoint, we, um, we you know, revisited where we were writing checks, um, provided checks to like the Detroit Rescue Mission that without a request, we just showed up and said, we know you're gonna need this, here you go. Um, we had procured masks back in February um, and, you know, had a pallet of them sitting here. Um, and we really focused on the homeless population, organizations that support veterans in all of our locations. Um, clearly our headquarters city, but, um, you know, the St. Pat Center in St. Louis was able to open and minister to the homeless veterans because S3 made sure that they had masks and they had hand sanitizers and then they had some funds in order to do that, to buy the equipment they needed to, to separate appropriately. Um, I personally made hand delivered the mask to Mariners Inn. Um, and to make sure that they had what they needed. So we, we, we gave in a way that aligns with us three and those of you who know us know what our focus is. Um, we actually put a lot of support behind Michigan Humane Society. Um, Michigan Humane Society provided free um, pet food, medicine and care. We gave away as much pet food in two months as we did all of last year out of the pet pantry. Um, because people didn't want to have to give up that four-legged or three-legged or three-pod member of their family, um, but their resources were really tight. So I know you've seen some of the videos I've shared where cars were just lined up and people were crying because they were like, we thought we were going to have to get rid of our cat or our dog, um, and now we can put our funds somewhere else. So we also, we still aligned with the mission that's important to us three. Um, and then we set about we, we created some new jobs that we've never filled before. Um, we're doing a lot of frontline screening work, which is normally not what we would do as a technology and finance sub company, but it let us go out and, and offer employment to individuals that really needed it. Um, and that, you know, it was a basic skill, but it, we were able to package it up so that it was at a good pay rate on, um, and then from a, you know, from a personal standpoint, and it's like leadership needs to be present. Um, so I've been in our office some combination of every day um, since this started in March. Um, I've already started traveling again. Of course, we're taking all the precautions. If you walk in here, we've got the automated temperature um, gadgets that look like little robots. They're actually really cool. We ordered those back in the beginning of March. We've got equipment, we've got hand sanitizer. Um, but we all really felt that we needed to be present, that our customers needed to know that we weren't going away, 
um, that our consultants needed to know that we cared. Um, every single consultant around the world received a package from us three that had custom made green masks, of course, and then N95 masks, surgical masks, a thank you note from me, um, hand sanitizer. If any consultants had to be frontline, which many did, we hand delivered the package to them so that they had everything they needed. Um, and we've, um, you know, touch wood, we've got a lot of people around the world. We've had three people that were sick and that's all. So we were very, very protective, but we also recognize that, and everyone on this panel knows that this is how I view the world. The best thing we could do was keep people working, get people in jobs, um, and then continue to support our community. And, and I will tell you, working in all the countries that we work and all the states that we work, there isn't a spreadsheet that we could create that could keep track of all of the changing rules, all of the changing guidelines, what, who can go and what country at what time and who can come through what airport and who has to be at home and who kind of has to be at home and, mm -hmm. um, and it's still ever changing. So we're, um, you know, we look at this in, in terms of quarters, we think we've got two and a half more quarters um, before we'll, um, we'll, we'll be in a more regular environment. Um, we ban the word new normal because our job every single day is just to figure out how to move the needle forward. Um, and we ban the words post pandemic um, because our job is also to keep doing everything we can do right now and not wait. All right, let me move to uh, the Reverend Solomon Kenlock, senior, senior pastor of Triumph Church. First of all, I want to say good morning to all of uh, my co-panelists. Uh, Banker Lay, I want to take my hat off to you uh, for not just uh, communicating, articulating concerns uh, that we face in our community, but also being a convener of critical community conversations uh, such as this. And so I applaud you for continuing to be a fearless fighter. Uh, one of the things that I reflect on uh, just sitting here even now is the words of Dr. King. Uh, Dr. King said that the measure of the character of a man is not dictated and determined um, by where he stands in the time of comfort and convenience, uh, but is dictated and determined by where he stands in the season of a crisis. Uh, one of the things that we all can agree upon is that this is a tremendous crisis. It's a crisis uh, for many of us of a proportion that we've never seen in our particular lifetime. And we had already uh, known uh, that there were disparities uh, in our community, that there were inequities in our communities as Jeff alluded to earlier. Uh, but what COVID did, COVID uh, let us know that in many of those areas, those disparities had been exasperated. Uh, we already knew we had health inequities, uh, but COVID uh, showed us uh, how deep those disparities go whenever you got uh, a 14% uh, population of African Americans facing 40% uh, of the death toll because of this virus. Uh, we already knew we had a housing issue, um, particularly when you look at 2010 to 2017, there was a tremendous $600 million over taxation uh, and one out of four homes uh, in Wayne County went through the foreclosure process. Um, so we knew we had that. We knew we had environmental risk in our community. We knew we had uh, a lack of paid leave, uh, access to clean water. And so we already were in the midst of a crisis. Uh, and the crisis uh, just uh, exasperated the disparities that we knew we existed. Uh, when Triumph Church uh, looked at this crisis, uh, we understood that it was the responsibility of the church uh, to take our theology to impact our sociology. How we see God uh, should impact and influence what we are willing to do for our fellow man, for our fellow brother and sister. And so what uh, we did was we ensured uh, that the voice of God and also the preacher uh, was more vocal and also uh, that the character of the church uh, was more visible. And one of the ways we did that is look at how could we continue to articulate hope? Um, because we can make it without a lot of things, but we can't make it without hope. And um, we need hope. That's something tenaciously we needed to hang on to. 
And so what we did is look for ways that we can uh, continue to articulate uh, good news and give people a hope uh, when they were getting so much bad news from other networks. Uh, and so we expand our social media platform. Uh, within that first month, uh, we were reaching over 150,000 viewers. Uh, we expanded our television ministry. Uh, we went on we went on programming on channel 62, channel 20, uh, and channel 4, and we still continue to host those 30-minute segments on a weekly basis on Sunday morning and Sunday night. Uh, we also uh, opened up a drive-in uh, worship experience where people can pull in in their vehicles uh, and have and enjoy vehicular worship uh, without getting out their car and refraining from any uh, physical action. Um, but also we understood that it was not just about worship. Uh, while uh, we miss that relational component, um, because we do believe in giving out information, the internet was good for us for information and education, uh, but the transformation element comes in and our ability to connect and to relate uh, with one another. And so when others were being turned away, they could not have uh, funeral services, although we limited the participation, uh, even in the midst of crisis, we still marry people. Uh, we still uh, bury people uh, because people still had uh, to face the reality of what uh, was they were going through. And uh, so we continue to advance in so many other areas. Uh, one of the things that we did in the midst of outreach, um, we started early on by uh, opening up uh, or exasperating and increasing our efficacy as it relates to our grocery giveaway. Uh, we increased the numbers from 500 a week to 2,000 uh, families a week. Um, it was tremendous because everybody was uh, wrestling with food shortages. I mean, we were going, uh, I thought I had relationships <laughs> uh, until I started reaching out uh, to many grocers and they couldn't even keep uh, the shelf stock. And so what we had to do is pull local uh, uh, retailers in and they were able to partner with us and we were able uh, to uh, contract them uh, so that they were able to stay in business and keep afloat. But at the same time, they were able uh, to purchase items along with their items in order for us to give away. And we've been able to accommodate up to 2000 people a week. Just in the last seven days, uh, we touched uh, 3000 individuals uh, by giving out $50 a piece uh, also uh, giving them a week of groceries uh, because we try to do that. Um, we also not only did things with our grocery giveaway, uh, we increased our benevolence outreach. Um, we also uh, decided uh, to host community conversations uh, so that we could connect uh, organizations like DTE, organizations like Legal Aid and Defenders Association who have uh, assistance uh, with uh, helping people uh, pay back rearage of utility bills and uh, assistance in rent and uh, other things that they were facing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the resources connected to the people who needed the most. You know this, uh, Bank LA, and, and those of you that sit with me this morning, so many times, many people that have the resources don't know how uh, to connect those resources with the people that need it the most. Because uh, so many times, just to be honest, we can have um, uh, extortionists in our community who profess to be leaders and can deliver to people, but never really make the connection. And one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure, listen, we know how to connect people to those resources. And it has been a tremendous uh, blessing. Um, I'm glad DTE is represented here today um, because they had over, uh, got over $20 million that they're trying to connect to help people pay uh, rearage as it relates to their bills and uh, legal aid and so many others that we will continue to connect to make sure that community take advantage of this. Also, we continue to host community cold red conversations. Uh, two weeks ago, we connected the community with Janice Winfrey and also Don Calloway of the National Voters Protection Action uh, Fund out of Washington, just engaging people of their and reminding them of their social responsibility because all of us need to uh, participate in the electoral process to understand uh, that uh, not voting has uh, community consequences and has personal implications. And so we held 
of those conversations, engaging. The city clerk right now is offering $600 a day for people who work on election day and $1,200 for people who work two days. And so we wanted to make sure that we weren't just sitting on the sidelines uh, talking about uh, what people are doing wrong on the field. We got to get people out of the stands, get them on the field and make them become a part of what's going on. And so those code red conversations help us engage those individuals. Also, uh, we were able to sit down and have a fireside chat with Gary Peters because we wanted to know uh, what does a Biden administration look like? Uh, what does a Trump administration look like uh, depending upon who ends up in the White House and how does that affect the people that live in this particular area and what was their perspective? What could we expect for them to prioritize as policies? Um, this week, uh, we are hosting a conversation with a national civil rights figure, uh, Dr. Eric Michael Dyson. He'll be sharing with us uh, the following week. We're hosting conversations uh, with Lieutenant uh, Governor uh, Gilchrist. We're hosting conversations with Mike Duggan on the demolition proposal. We're hosting conversations with those uh, that are opponents uh, to the demolition of po proposal. Uh, we are hosting conversations uh, to make sure that we are talking about uh, police and uh, social reform with Kim Worthy and also Karen McDonald, uh, who's currently running for Oakland County Prosecutor. Uh, one of the things that we have got to make sure in the midst of this is that uh, those that lead us and those that have the power uh, to influence laws and legislation in order to impact their lives, have to include people as a part of that conversation. One of the things we understand is we can't let people write a script and a narrative about our life unless we're participating in that conversation. And for so long, we have had uh, so many people who felt like they didn't have to take community concerns into consideration. And we wanted those cold red conversations to say, listen, we cannot be ignored. That's one of the reasons you see the flames of intolerance are burning right now across this land because Martin King tried to teach us that that's the language, that protest is the language of those that feel like they've been left out, left behind, and they have not been heard. And it is the responsibility of the church, it is the responsibility of the preacher, always, always to use the poor pit, not for privatization and not for individuality but to use it in order to corporately lift the people. And one of the things that the corona crisis has done, it has re-energized and realigned the mission and the focus of what we should be doing as a ministry. All right, the Reverend Solomon Kenlock, senior pastor of Triumph Church. And of course, that's why uh, he is the senior pastor of Triumph Church. And uh, this is gonna be uh, quite, um, a different kind of engagement here because uh, in the past we've only had uh, C-suite business leaders. And I think given where we're headed, as Reverend Kenlock laid out, uh, Jerry at DTE and um, Jeff at uh, Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, there ought to be a nexus uh, between uh, industry and community, uh, a nexus that creates real impact. Uh, when you look at Detroit, and I hear what uh, S3 is doing, I hear what DT is doing, I hear what uh, Jeff said uh, he's doing at the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Uh, from people who are looking from the outside, when they look in, it's like, okay, but we're not feeling the impact at the bottom where it matters most. Uh, Cindy, how would you respond to that in, in, in light of just how COVID has affected people uh, who were already, in fact, bottom out, who were already struggling, and then it's almost like having, you know, the roof of your house just dump on you when your house actually was not on solid ground anyway. But, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with you at all, Bankley. And I think that, um, I think you have to go to the people, right? And, and I think, you know, you have to step over off the pulpit and off the podium and out of your office and actually go and figure out how you can help. Um, and, you know, I mean, Jerry's sitting in a facility where today he's going to have a community outreach meeting. He's not sitting on the 24th floor um, at the corporate headquarters. And I'm sitting on the sixth floor 
um, with our forward facing team, which is why you hear the background noise and you see people walking back and forth. And I, and I think the the difference with the with the Reverend is that he is actually walking the streets and finds the people that needs to be that need to be helped. Um, Jeff is sitting in the city of Detroit. Um, and I see him walking all the time, um, looking and engaging. And there isn't, in my opinion, there isn't another way to do that. Um, you can't, you can't do that with email blasts. You, you, you actually have to be willing to go out and find the people that need the help. Um, you know, the, the project that we're doing with the Michigan Humane Society in the North End, we have physically spoken to 1,600 homes and individuals in the North End, one person at a time. Um, not only to find out if they need help or support um, from those services, but we've connected them with DTE, we've connected them with social services, we've connected them with other entities, but we didn't do it because we invited them to a meeting, we sent out an email blast, it's because we walked up to every single door and knocked on the door. Um, and, and I personally think we have a better understanding of who lives in the North End, um, how many people are in the household, what their challenges are, um, than really any other agency in the city of Detroit. Uh, and, and it can be done if you think about the number of corporations, the number of leaders, the number of nonprofits that we have um, that are all funded or trying to be funded. Um, you have the ability to actually have the foot soldiers to go out and find who needs the help and figure out how to connect that help to them. Um, because it's not intuitive, it's not easy to find, it's not easy to understand. Um, and, and a lot of people, they only have so much time every day. Um, and if it's navigating through a form to figure out how to apply for a particular type of aid and they don't have good internet access um, and they have an adult in the house they have to care for, a child that they have to care for, or they have to go, they have an opportunity to go have, pick up food, um, that form always ends up going back to the bottom of the list, right? I mean, so I think it's easy for leadership to forget um, that everyday challenges um, take away the opportunity for people to take, to take advantage of the resources that are available. So you have to go to them and you have to help remove those barriers, if, if that makes sense. Very old fashioned, very traditional, um, but it can be done. All right, um, let's go to um, um, uh, Jeff. Um, uh, from what Cindy said though, I, I think, uh, I hear what you're saying from the state level. For those who are in Detroit, looking at what is happening, they don't feel, they don't, they don't, see, the, they don't see the energy, but also they don't feel like their lives are being impacted from the dollars, from the dollars that you have mentioned. How, what, how do you address that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really important question. And I think, you know, exactly what Cindy said is, is you do have to get out of, of your comfort zone. And it's very easy, I think, in, in times of crisis, I think for leaders to circle the wagons, right? To make decisions in a, in a bubble um, and assume that they understand what is um, happening on the ground or, or what's best in terms of a program or how to use a dollar. Um, and so what I've told my team at, at every you know, turn is that we, we have to, communication during a crisis is critical. And it's not just in communication in our own teams, it's not communication amongst the 3,000 people that work for me directly in the state of Michigan, but it's communication with various stakeholder groups across the state. It's communication with you know, individuals who are impacted by uh, the various programs that we're trying to run. Unemployment insurance is a good example of that. Um, you know, we've had 2.6 million people um, apply for unemployment insurance in the state of Michigan. Um, you know, when you kind of size that towards the uh, number of people who are in the workforce, which is about 5 million, uh, you can imagine how many people um, and how many just kind of decisions we have to make in aggregate for a large group. But what I've asked the team to do and pushed our director of unemployment insurance and our deputy director and folks on the ground to do is hold forums to go out and do um, engagement with uh, community members 
through elected officials like state representatives, um, through uh, mayors or local uh, city council people. You know, when someone asks us to, to engage with their constituents or engage more directly and hear the, the specific feedback, we want to be able to go out and do that. We've held hundreds of these um, and dozens and dozens in the city of Detroit. We've done that too for, I think, other programs that we have out there. Um, so the Futures for Frontliners program, um, we've, we've done some extensive outreach through community groups, through business leaders. Um, you know, we've, uh, we have a plan to go out and uh, actually visit job sites, um, you know, grocery stores and such to make sure that these Futures for Frontliners, these frontliners actually have the opportunity um, to be able to understand what the, uh, the program offers and uh, for us to understand how they're perceiving it, um, you know, and, and potentially pivot. Folks can go to michigan.gov slash frontliners to get more information, but that's not enough. We have to be on the street, you know, in, in people's uh, lives. So far, um, Detroiters have, have shown a huge amount of interest. We've had 3,000 applications in less than a week from Detroiters alone. Um, and while, you know, I think it's, it's good to have an application, we've got to make sure that uh, all those who applied, that we make contact with them again, that we talk to them about the jobs that are in demand, the opportunities at companies like DTE and others that they could, uh, uh, that this education could lead to. So I, you know, I think it's, it's very important for us to be on the ground. And uh, I personally, Cindy, you know, talked about seeing me walking around and I, I see her, you know, when I'm walking around the community too. Um, but I've gone on a number of inspections um, with my OSHA to make sure that workplaces are safe because I want to understand what's happening on the ground. I want to hear from those employees who are putting themselves at risk um, and making sure that uh, their workplaces are, are not endangering their, their health, their lives. Um, and, and so I think, again, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of things, but it's absolutely essential we get out there, we hear from people, and that we're trying to uh, make sure our messages are resonating. Um, Jerry, your take on that and, and how, we, how we create real impact from the bottom up, because it's one thing to say we've spent this amount of dollars, we've budgeted this money, but then we have untold suffering here in the city. Well, when we look again, we look at the economic index, and I'm sure you travel around the world a lot. It says Detroit leads the nation in the largest poverty city. Detroit leads the nation on COVID-19 and all of that. So let me uh, start with a little bit of, um, I guess, history uh, with me at DT Energy. So uh, the guy that hired me, his name was Steve Ewing, and some of you may remember him. He was the president of uh, Michigan, or Michigan Consolidated Gas Company. And uh, at his retirement uh, speech in 2006, uh, you know, he said, don't be confused. Your work is not inside these walls or inside these conferences conference rooms, your work is in the community. And that uh, to ser serve uh, one of the poorest cities in, in the nation uh, is a privilege and not a burden. So those are mindsets that I went into the Michigan job when I became president of Michigan, you know, long before I became CEO of DT Energy that uh, one, it's a privilege to serve and that our work is not inside our offices, our work is in the community. And then, so how do you deal with uh, poverty, you deal with it one person at a time. So our, our partnership with Pastor Kinlock is an example of that, where I said to my people, go find leaders in this community that can connect us uh, to the people who need us the most and, and find solutions uh, for those people. And I think our premise at DT is that we will go to the ends of the earth to help those who need our help most and those who are most vulnerable. And uh, that's our passion. It's my personal passion. Uh, my personal passion comes from the fact that uh, my family lived in poverty in Italy uh, with no running water or heat in the home. And uh, so I, come to, uh, I came to Canada. My family came to Canada and came to America to find a better future. And the way we found that was, which is the second part of it. So I think one is connecting people to the resources that are available in the most effective way. And we can't do that alone. We know we need partnerships. We need nexus, as you mentioned, uh, Bank Life. The second part is we need, people in poverty need work, just like my parents needed work. Uh, and I needed work uh, so that I could live a better life. Uh, we need to create access to work. And the word access, the lack of access is what creates poverty. You know, people who are poor, don't have connections in corporate America to say, hey, you know, how about, uh, you know, you take a look at my son or my daughter for a job. So our job as big corporate leaders 
is to broaden the web of access uh, for workers so that they can get a job. Because when you got a job, everything works in life, right? It's the grease in life. You know, it uh, helps your self-esteem. You know, it uh, makes you tired at night so you don't go looking for trouble. And, uh, and it also helps you feed a family. And so how are we doing that? Well, we've got all kinds of apprenticeship programs that we've introduced. Like we, uh, those are three schools, uh, trade schools that we worked at, Randolph, Breithoff, and Southeastern, where DT led the way to raise $26 million to rehabilitate those schools and get much higher enrollment. And that was a nexus because we were gonna see a shortage in trades, not only at DT, but the auto companies and others. And we needed to train workers for, for in the Detroit area uh, for great jobs of the future. You know, we, we, we have good access to colleges for professional jobs like lawyers, accountants, and engineers. What we didn't have good access to was good tradesmen and women uh, that could go into these trades and have great jobs. So to give you an example, uh, we're also opening up a tree trim school in Detroit. You know, we've got 1,200 tree trimmers on our property every day trimming trees. And those jobs lead to linemen, which make $150,000 a year. What we want to do is start training local Detroiters into those tree trim jobs so that they can become the future overhead linemen at DT Energy because we're hiring 50 to 100 of them every year into apprenticeship programs. So that's one example. So I think one is stabilize the crisis by working with partners like Pastor Kinlog to connect one person at a time to available resources because sometimes it's hard to connect. But once we can make the connection, usually it's pretty successful in terms of stabilizing that crisis. And two, Let's get people to work because that's the, I really believe that's the grease in life. Once your hands are busy, everything starts to work well in your life. Uh, Reverend Kenlock, your take. But when I think about it, I, I'm reminded of what Maynard Jackson uh, did when he became the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, he wanted to make sure that he developed a culture of diversity and inclusion. And so one of the things that he did was he said it was his job uh, not to take seats away from the table, but to make sure that you were adding more. And that's what this conversation is about. It's about adding uh, more seats uh, to the table. When you look at the wealth gap in this country, uh, and if you look at the most recent study uh, based on uh, Cleveland's Federal Reserve, uh, when they talk about uh, that the leading driver of the uh, racial uh, gap in this country, wealth gap in this country, is not because of home ownership and is not because of entrepreneurship. It's uh, inequality in income. And at some point, we have to look at the fact that in the African American community, you got a penny uh, to every dollar uh, compared uh, to uh, white wealth. And at some point, uh, when we look at that, we have to understand that we got to address that because as uh, Jerry Narcia just mentioned, it's about equity. Um, when we start talking about equality, uh, equality during the civil rights movement, giving uh, people a seat on the bus or giving them a seat at the counter, as Dr. King alluded, it didn't cost much. It didn't cost but ego. It didn't cost but giving up tradition. But whenever you start talking about equity, that becomes a difficult conversation to have. But in order for us to address this, that's what the conversation has to become about. It becomes about equity. Uh, those of us that remember uh, the uh, tragedy of Emmett Ted Hill, who was killed, and the mama decided, she said, listen, look at what they did to my boy. She said, I refuse to close that coffin. I want that coffin open because I need the world to see what hatred can do to a child. African-Americans at that point already knew that you could be lynched. They knew that you could be killed. They knew that you could disappear in the middle of the night. But when the world had to confront the fact that it could happen to children, that's when eyes open in the community. And that's what this is about. This is about what type of legacy do we wanna leave our children? And our responsibility is to make sure that we leave this world better than the way we found it. How do we do that? Uh, we have to make sure that we're making an impact on a level where people can feel it. And the best way to do that 
is by those of us that are influenced because we got to approach it knowing that there's already some skepticism. Anytime you can see somebody suffocated to death uh, as a result of the callousness of another individual and they know it being videotaped and they still don't care, just think about what's happening when they're not being recorded, when they're not being videotaped. And so if that is not enough in order to shake the foundation or the terra firma beneath our feet in order to say, listen, things have got to change and they got to change now. We can't cool off uh, because as I often say, a slow decision is a no decision. If you take too long to make a decision, then the decision gets made for you. This is a sense of urgency. This is a moment that we got to seize, we got to take advantage of. And the way we do that is continue to do what we're doing right now. We leverage our influences. We leverage our influence so people can see change. So the corporate influence, the governmental influence that we have here, we follow the Lewis Sullivan principle. Lewis Sullivan said when he saw apartheid in South Africa, listen, use social and economic influence and pressure in order to bring about an end and a change to apartheid. We got the might to change. Uh, and so that's why some would be skeptical is why we're not seeing that change at a, at a, a accelerated speed uh, that makes a difference in the lives. We got, we got the influence right now to say, listen, in order to deal with police and social reform, we got to do something about qualified immunity. We got to start holding people accountable uh, for violating constitutional rights. How are you going to prosecute people if you don't lower the standard and the threshold about holding people accountable? We can leverage our influence in order to do that. We can leverage our influence in making sure that we have more uh, minority participation in leadership positions uh, by leveraging our vendors in corporate America, looking at our vendors and saying, listen, uh, not only uh, do we have African-American vendors, we also want to take a look at uh, how are you doing business? Because at the end of the day, uh, no one listens uh, to anybody clearer and better than somebody that's paying you. So if I'm paying you, certainly they're going to take you into consideration. And we can make sure that our employees understand uh, that this is a time that we got to use as an opportunity to create more diversity and inclusion. Our vendors understand that we got to use this as a time to create more diversity and, and inclusion. Um, our corporate and community leaders got to leverage their influence and might in order to cultivate an environment and say, listen, everybody has to participate in this. You don't have to do it the way that I do it. I don't have to do it the way that you do it but everybody has to participate. Everybody has to use the platform and the resources that they've been given in order to make sure that we are making an impact and a difference. Uh, corporate America can cont continue, uh, as Jerry Narcia just alluded to, uh, making sure that you have community liaisons and community representatives that's time you, I'm not the only community leader. I'm, I, 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 I believe that's where we've gone wrong in so many instances where we send one person into the room I'm not the only person that needs to be in the room. Uh, there needs to be uh, inclusive as it possibly can in order to make sure that we're addressing community issues. This is a community problem. This is not a solo problem. This is a community problem. And the more people we get to participate in that conversation, the more inclusive it is. And uh, the more uh, you can say, listen, I gave you an opportunity to participate in the conversation when we were trying to come up with the solution. You didn't take advantage of it but not to include people into that conversation. Uh, that's where the skepticism began and that's where the questioning begins of whether or not we're really looking for resolve. I'm gonna ask a, a special request of all of you on this panel. Uh, we are, this has been uh, live streamed on, on my page and on the, uh, on the home church page of Triumph Church. So we got a lot of folks who are watching this conversation right now. So it's been live streamed on multiple platforms and I'm gonna make a request of you because there's a lot going on here and we don't have much time. We have half hour and I know you all are busy, but I'm gonna make a request here if we can do a part two of this conversation here. And uh, because there's a lot here that I, I don't think we have, Cindy, I don't think we have enough time to unpack uh, what has been discussed here, but I just feel like this conversation is one that is made for the moment. Uh, Jerry and Cindy, uh, you know, Reverend Ken Lack talked about Leon Sullivan, just a quick background. He was the first African-American uh, member of a major 
uh, corporate board. Uh, he was on the board of General Motors. Uh, Reverend Sullivan came out of Philadelphia and he was on the streets building houses for poor people. He used this leverage. He used this incredible leverage and made his all way all the way to the GM board of directors. And when he got in there, he shocked their conscience. An eminent scholar, sophisticated man, very sophisticated. I mean, brilliant and all of that, but he used his leverage. He used his power. He used all of that he could in service of, you know, helping the homeless in Philadelphia. And he got involved in the fight in apartheid. He got GM to divest from South Africa. I mean, he did some remarkable things. I mean, he was a giant of a man, but he could walk in a room with kings and, and make a demand and, and do it in a very sophisticated, elegant way where even if you disagree with him, you know, it's like it's hard to say no to him because he just had that personality. And I, I, Cindy, I want to take this to you because when Reverend uh, Ken Lack mentions Reverend Leon Sullivan, I'm also thinking about another leader, the late Judge Damon Keith, uh, because uh, this is where we are. I feel like Detroit needs uh, what maybe we call it a new brand of leadership of sort. And I see Reverend Ken Lack represents it well here, but, you know, you know, we can't clone Erwin Kenlock, right? So we can't clone Cindy Pasky. We can't clone Tina Patterson. You can't clone me. You know, sometimes I'm wondering how many hours of sleep I get a day. But we need a new brand of leadership that, that, that will, I don't want to use the word intercede because it makes us as if we are begging, but that's, that, that becomes the intercessor, if you will, between private industry, government, and community. In the case of George Damon Keith, I mean, he was trusted in the, in the community, corporate community. Uh, he could lock, he could bring in corporate leaders and spank them in a room and make them make a commitment. They can't say no to him. He could do the same thing with African-American leaders. You know, that's how he saved the Charles Wright Museum. So my question to you, Cindy, is from where you sit as a corporate leader to what Reverend Kenlack just said here, how do you respond to that? And what do corporate leaders like yourself are looking for in terms of uh, looking for allies in, in, in the fight against poverty? Because I know you're committed. I've seen what you're, what you're doing. Uh, how do you, what, what are you looking for? You know, thank you, Bank Lane. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not on any corporate boards. Right, um, and and I don't think it's because I'm not capable, but um, I've never been asked, and that's okay. Um, but you also know there's a lot of forums that I'm not asked to participate in, and and I'm okay with that as well. Um, I think you know for to to have corporate leaders like we've got Jerry here, right? Um, we need individuals that when they ask us to participate, it's because they're going to be on the, the ground next to us and go walk and get it done. Um, they're not going to show up in many instances, just ask for a check, want to have a press release, but not actually walk with the people. And, um, you know, if, if we can do that, if we can be, out and we can volunteer and we, I mean, my organization isn't as large as Jerry's, but it's pretty large and it's all around the world. Um, and if the best thing that I can do is walk up to Mariner's Inn and talk to the individuals that are there and make sure that they have the resources that they need and actually hand them to them myself, um, that's not a hard thing to do. So I need to engage in even an additional level um, I need leaders, leaders in the community um, that will actually do the same thing. Um, and after you do that, um, and I think you, you see this with, with what's going on with, with the Reverend and Jerry, after you do that, then to say, can you support this financially? Can you support this this way? It's a much different conversation. Um, but there are, there are a lot of leaders in the community where the financial request comes first and it's behind a podium um, in a conference room. And it's like, well, how about you walk around with me at Easter Market and let me show you how well they did when all of this started to get food to people that needed food in a safe way. How about you come see that? Um, 
we don't need to break any rules, but you can put a mask on, you can drive in your car and you can go be with the people that need your help. Um, I, you can come with me and volunteer at the pet pantry and you can go out and you can talk to everybody and you can hear their stories and you can figure out how else to help them. But for me personally, um, and I think, I think Jerry would agree. I mean, if, if we're going to engage and we're personally going to engage, we want somebody that's next to us and we don't necessarily want it to be in a fancy conference room. Um, and, and we don't need a press release. We want somebody that's hand in hand with us. that says, okay, this is how we make a difference. So, so let me, before I go to Jerry, let me take it to Jeff. Uh, you are in government and, and, and that's the number one institution that we all criticize that enough is not being done. Uh, talk about how, from you, where you sit, uh, how you interface uh, with people who say, look, we're here to help the community. But then, I mean, later you find out we've built this partnership, but actually we're not seeing any results because you know, it, it is not going to the, 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 the what I call the, 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 the folks who need the support the most, you know, because it's not everybody who comes up to you and give you their business card and say, you know, well, I represent so-and-so, represent so-and-so, period. You know, and I think when we have more people who are saying, well, Jeff Donnerfield, we know the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity has over a billion dollar budget, but we represent so-and-so and so-and-so, and resources are being diverted to so and so and so and so, when actually it's not really going there. And so I think it keeps people away. And I hear this in the community a, a lot. It keeps people away from the right people getting the help or the right people building the partnership that will create real change and can force government to be accountable. So how do you decipher? That's what I'm saying here. How do you decipher to say, okay, we're dealing with folks who actually have their pulse on the community are supposed to say in somebody dealing with somebody who has 10 million titles, but really doesn't have their pulse in the community and actually are not trusted. And the more you are aligned with them, the more in fact you, you also are labeled as untrustful because they're saying, well, you know, if, if, you, if you hang out with so-and-so, well, that, that's, that what, that's what it means. Well, you know, I think one of the, it's, it's interesting, right? Because, uh, you know, I came to the city of Detroit working for, uh, on, on a leave absence for Ford Motor Company. And, uh, you know, I, I worked in the city of Detroit for four years, then moved on to the state, um, you know, with, uh, with the governor here in the last year. And I did it because I was frustrated, right? I was frustrated with bureaucracy. I was frustrated with the speed of government versus the speed of business versus the, you know, the speed that I think people need to feel like there is change happening. Um, you know, in Detroit, right, uh, Jerry talked about the, uh, the work we did around the career technical education system and investing $26 million, which was led by DTE Energy, um, we had to go outside of all of the, the various governmental bureaucracies and outside of um, all of the, the at the time, uh, it was under emergency management, we signed an agreement with DPS to make sure that we could have control and that we could actually make an impact very quickly. So within a year, we had renovated that school. We had doubled enrollment, tripled enrollment from about an 80 students to 310 students. We had brought in new equipment and we had done so many different things. That wouldn't have been accomplished if we had worked through the same kind of process that, uh, that you know, normally happens within government. It took business leading the way and taking a, a chance and then talking to their colleagues and you know, calling the question to say, look, you're in, uh, you need uh, skilled trades individuals too, do something about it. Like don't just sit there and, and write a check, but actually come in there, engage with us, make sure that we have the right teachers in the classroom. Make sure we have the right equipment set up exactly how you want to see it uh, at the job site. So that's, I think that's a frustration um, that, you know, I, I have felt on a continual basis of we've got to make these systems work. And so, you know, when I get up to, when I got up to Lansing, of course, and you talk about a billion dollars worth of, uh, of budget that we have, you talk about the, you know, the systems that we have. So often uh, people fall back on the, this is how we've always done it right? Um, this is what our funder asks of us. So we've met these metrics of Department of Labor, and so we're successful. And I keep saying to them, that's, that's not enough. That is the absolute baseline of what you need to do to just make sure that the money keeps flowing. The question is, what are you trying to solve as a problem? And the bigger issue is sometimes, and I think a lot of times, we don't know what those problems are 
unless we engage on the ground individually with people, with folks who are on the front lines, whether it's trying to help solve for poverty um, at a, at a uh, you know, soup bank or a uh, Gleaner's Food Bank, um, whether it's at a church, uh, dealing with a congregation um, that has a multitude of problems, whether it's in a job training program down the street, um, you know, on the east side of Detroit, uh, like um, Akimalan Village, that is trying to figure out what it is that they can do to get those individuals. As Jerry Norcia said, the one-on-one -on -one help, you know, if you start trying to get uh, the question called on, what does it take for these 10 people, these 20 people, these 30 people that you're helping on an individual basis, you start seeing patterns. That's what we did with driver's responsibility fees. That was another good example where, you know, we had been told that there were all these issues and barriers to work um, when we started working in the city of Detroit. And we went in and we said, you know what, one of the biggest or, or one of a, a group of population that had some of the biggest barriers were people returning from prison. So we're going to try to take our services upstream. We're going to go into the prisons. We actually started training programs um, at uh, Ryan Correctional Facility. And we helped train them in culinary arts. We helped train them in skilled trades um, and a number of other things. And upon graduation, we were finding that 75% of them couldn't get a driver's license. And then their economic opportunity, the job prospects that they had were hugely limited by that. And so we said, why the heck is that? And we started talking to other uh, programs around the city that had been dealing with this for years. We started talking to individuals who were dealing with this to try to get that picture and found that there were 70,000 Detroiters, 76,000 Detroiters who could not get a driver's license because they had an outstanding driver's responsibility fee. Simply a, another tax that was put on them by uh, state government. Um, it was well-intentioned at the time trying to close a budget gap, but it really impacted people in ways that they had no idea uh, about when they passed this law. So we went uh, and started building a coalition with business, with community leaders, with individuals who could tell their personal story on this. And then, you know, use government to really, um, you know, call the question to say, do we want to uh, simply keep fining people thousands of dollars, keep them out of jobs, or do we want to flip that narrative and give people as much opportunity as possible to get a job, to build a better quality of life and, and move, remove this barrier? So when we started bringing it, um, I think, to legislators and started bringing it to the governor, Governor Snyder at the time, um, there was a lot of resistance, right? That's a lot of money that they would lose. There was a lot of, you know, again, this is how we always did it. But we had to really take that coalition. We had to tell those personal stories and we were able to get $600 million worth of debt eliminated. We were able to forgive that debt for 360,000 Michiganders, 76,000 again, that were in the city of Detroit. And a whole bunch of people got their driver's license back. In the city of Detroit, we created a program that said, we'll get your driver's license back for you early if you just enroll in a workforce program. 5,000 people signed up in the first week. I mean, that's the kind of momentum that we have to keep building. And that's what we're trying to build it at the state level. And basically, I'll, I'll just you know, say it's, it's a continual effort that we all have to be engaged in to make sure that bureaucracies, that uh, you know, institutions that generally are not designed to have that type of one-on-one -on -one impact to uh, move quickly, that we just aren't satisfied with that and that we continue to keep calling the question and make sure that people can feel that on the ground and that we understand and, and quantify what the real changes that are needed on the ground are. Uh, Jerry, your take. Well, I'll give you my take is that uh, in all large organizations, sometimes uh, bureaucracies become confused as to what their purpose is and who they're there to really serve, right? Mm -hmm. And it almost becomes a machine to serve itself versus serving the people that they were designed to serve. So let me give you a live example. Uh, when this crisis hit, you know, I started talking to the chair of the uh, Michigan Public Service Commission and the director of uh, um, Health and Human Services and said, you know, why is it that it takes us 60 days to process energy assistance, 45 to 60 days. And, uh, you know, there's all these reasons at DTE and at DHHS and the Michigan Public Service Commission that were set up over years to create all this machinery that got in the way of delivering energy assistance in a rapid way. And uh, so I personally took on the challenge because uh, I felt it required uh, me to change my own organization and also influence the change inside DHHS and the MPSC. So I got on the phone every two days 
with the director of DHHS and the chair of the MPSC and my, my leaders to say, we're going to move this ball and we're going to move it quickly and, and disassemble this bureaucracy that was built over many years that I felt was unnecessary. And so that's how you, you got to, and I kept reminding everybody, you know why we're here, right? We're here to serve and we're here to serve the poor. That's what this work is about. And that's not about serving us and our needs and having to check all these boxes and fill out all this information and 30 page applications. We need to get energy assistance in the hands of those who are needed the most and they're more desperate now than they ever have been. And, uh, and I got to tell you, I got to give it to, um, you know, not only to my people, but also to the MPSC and DHHS. We turned a 45 day process into a three or four day process. And that was huge, right, for customers in terms of being able to deliver energy assistance. So my message there is, that's just one example uh, that I was personally involved in, but there are many others that exist where we create these barriers, you know, like to employment, barriers to assistance, uh, barriers to education. I mean, and I think what we gotta do is just have the passion and start knocking those barriers down one at a time. And uh, this is a game of inches. It doesn't change overnight. But every time you knock down a barrier, you may have helped 5,000 people. You may have helped 10,000 people. And you just keep building on those successes. And that's how, you, uh, that's how you lift people out of poverty. And I think the other thing we got to remember is that when you lift people out of, out of poverty, it benefits all of society. And I think that's sometimes what people forget is that when you move somebody from poverty to a job and now they have a successful life and a successful family, You've created wealth for all Americans, not just for that American and their family. Uh, before I come to Reverend Kellogg, um, again, this has been live stream, but also, uh, as you all know, I'm on the airways every day, Monday to Friday from 11 to 1 p.m. So this is going to be rebroadcast this morning at 11 o'clock when I go live on the radio. So this entire conversation will be available to thousands of our listeners here. But Reverend Kellogg, uh, let me go straight to you, though, uh, in terms of just um, what Cindy said, how you create this nexus here, right, to, to see real change in Detroit. COVID is here. Poverty has been here before COVID. Uh, the, the right kind, is there a leadership model that you're, look, that you're looking for as a civic leader, as a minister, in terms of how we either engage or re-engage the corporate community in a way that it delivers results. And you invoke Reverend Sullivan. I invoke the late, the late Judge Damon Keith. These were exceptional leaders who really, you know, they, they use their influence to make things happen. And they did make things happen. Well, Banker Lake, uh, right here in the, in the city of Detroit, we have great precedents. Uh, when my mind reflects, I grew up around the corner from Tabernacle Baptist Church with Dr. Frederick Sampson. Uh, in the other direction, you had Dr. Charles Gilchrist Adams. In another uh, corner, you had uh, Bishop uh, Hughes of, of St. Stephen's. In another direction, you had uh, Bishop uh, Wright. Uh, and so these were men uh, that served in leadership who understood the role of the church and the responsibility, the perfunctory uh, and the responsibility that they were assigned and they were called. It was never to promote self. It was never uh, to use the platform for individuality or for just a person. We live in a day now where it's all about me, mine, I, that motivates and gets people uh, excited and uh, calls a lot to go into a frenzy. It's your time, it's your turn. But it's not just about you. Uh, we've learned that life is not meant to be lived independent but it's meant to be lived interdependent. All of us have a common mutuality. We have a common destiny that I cannot be what I'm supposed to be unless you're what you're supposed to be. We learned that from our leaders, that uh, we're in this thing together and we gotta confront the crisis we're in with a sense of urgency. Uh, that's why you see the flames of intolerance born because people are saying enough is enough. Uh, we waited long enough and the time is now all we're asking is that this land live up to the promise that is made that each of us have an unalienable right to pursue happiness in our own individual way you wrote it you put it in the document all we're asking you to do is to stand by it and to live by it right now we see the stats uh, they're suggesting that by the end of the year 
50% of black businesses won't even make it. 1.9% of black owned businesses receive PPE loans. SBA historically has not done the best job of reaching black owned businesses. And what we have got to make sure is that we're impacting that. And how do we do that? By pulling in our influences. Yes, we got uh, people that have always populated our community in order to uh, benefit themselves. But even when we note the civil rights movement, if you wanna look at a model, even when you note the civil rights movement with Dr. King, they didn't have every church, they didn't have every preacher on their side, but they went to the ones that had sense enough to know that we have and we should have a community responsibility, that we got a spiritual and a moral responsibility to make sure that equity and equality is found in our community. And there are people, I'm excited because I know I'm not the only one. There are so many uh, leadership in this land. But one of the things we got to do is do a better job of vetting. Uh, you don't need people who just need uh, their light bill paid or, 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 or leaders who just need some personal benefit as the relationship. You need people who can guarantee, listen, if you give me a dollar, I'm going to ensure that that dollar goes directly to the person. It's not going to be caught up on facility costs. It's not going to be caught up on administrative costs. We can't afford it to be wrapped up in facilities and utilities and for self-benefit. We got to make sure that these resources are going directly to the people. That's the kind of leaders that we need to bring to the table. People that don't need anything individually, but they just want to be a conduit and a vessel to get those resources to people who need it the most. If we can just start there, the whole context of the community conversation changes the game right there. Jeff Donnerfield, are those the kinds of leaders that the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity is dealing with? Well, I think it's the type of leaders we're trying to build. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's through consistent uh, expectations, right? Um, so I'll, I'll give you a, um, an, an example here of, you know, we're trying to build a, a number of coalitions around the state, around uh, trying to help people um, increase their education, trying to make sure that they can get better jobs and that those barriers can be removed. And again, um, you know, I think a lot of times we give those dollars out and um, again, we get lots of reports back uh, that say how well they were spent. Um, and uh, that uh, you know, met all of our guidelines. But I go back to my previous statements, that can only be the baseline. We have to be showing that both on an individual basis, people feel differently about how we're spending those dollars. And I think collectively that we're achieving larger goals. Cindy Paskey and um, the Mayor's Workforce Development Board, which she co-chairs, um, set a goal of, of helping 40,000 Detroiters um, you know, get jobs, uh, go to work. Um, and you know they, they knew it was gonna be tough. They knew it was gonna take more than what the resources they had at hand were uh, at the time. But by setting that goal, by hel helping everybody kind of point their spotlight at that vision, um, it really helped, uh, I think, coalesce the community. It helped make sure that uh, if you were choosing of how to spend a dollar, how to have that impact, folks understood what we were trying to drive towards. So I think it's, all, it's a couple things, making sure that we have big goals in mind making sure that those are solving big problems, but then also making sure that uh, at the end of the day, leaders are held accountable for uh, the, the fact that those dollars are getting to people, that those dollars are actually making an impact and that we're combining them, we're blending them with other resources that we have. Because this nexus you've been talking about, of uh, it can't just be business, it can't just be government, it can't just be you know, community organizations that are out there doing this on their own. It has to be a combination of all of us. And so one of the ways that we can show that combination and that we're all in it together is by blending our funding around common goals. So I, I really do think that we're, we're trying hard, uh, but again, you know, I think uh, there's always gonna be room to improve here. And as Jerry talked about bureaucracies, um, it's easy to fall back into um, when times are tough, when dollars are limited, uh, when there's so much going on that, um, you know, in, in this time of crisis, that it's hard to understand where to start. Um, it's easy to fall back into what we know and what we're comfortable with, and we can't let that happen. Uh, we're going to wrap up shortly. Uh, where do we go from here with, with COVID 
and what we're dealing with. Uh, Jerry Nocia, let me take, let me go to you. Well, I think the, uh, you know, the imperative in the moment is safety, right, of our people and our citizens. So when I think about, um, you know, the, the next six months, uh, the immediacy uh, is really to deal with um, the pandemic to make sure it doesn't get a hold of this city or this community uh, in a way that's uh, destructive again or more destructive. So I think all of us following good safety practices, like wearing our masks, I've got one here with me as soon as I leave this room, and, uh, and practic practicing good social distancing, I think it's going to be fundamental. We need to stay healthy, all of us, in order to be successful. So I know, to me, that's the first imperative. And then secondly, continue all the great work uh, that we've talked about today. Uh, let's get more people to work. Let's create more job opportunities. Let's create education opportunities uh, for individuals in, in the communities that we're talking about that are in poverty. And I think that's how we start to lift people out of poverty. So first, you need to be healthy, because without your health, one of my things, one of the things my parents always told me, you can you can have a lot of money, you can have a lot of a great job, but if you don't have your health, you really don't have anything. So let's let's work on that first. That's sort of the building block to get us through this pandemic, and hopefully we have a vaccine uh, that will help with that. But if not, then we got to do all the things that we need to do to remain healthy. And uh, so that's first, and then second. Let's work hard on education and employment. Uh, that's, that's where we will be. That's where DTE will be in terms of trying to lift people out of poverty. Uh, Cindy? Well, I think, um, I mean, I echo what Jerry says. Obviously, we have to be safe. And, um, you know, I, I think you can be present and be safe. I think you can be present with a mask on and you can social distance. And um, so I think in addition to being safe, leadership needs to be and must be present um, and, and present in a, in a way that listens, um, that's not hidden away. Um, and, you know, I, I meant what I said earlier, it's, um, you know, we don't use the words new normal in S3. We don't use the words post pandemic. We say, okay, today, this is how the world looks. So what do we need to do to move our agenda forward? Put people to work, keep people working and support our communities. Tomorrow it'll look a little bit different, um, but the objectives won't change. On, um, and when I, you know, when I worked with Nicole Shard Freeman on, on when all of us started with the workforce effort, I'm like, we're not changing our goal. We're not lowering our goal. We just have to figure out how we achieve that goal in a different way. What, what do we change? What tools are available to us? What resources can we bring to the table? Um, but you can't, you, you cannot allow the goal to be lowered. Um, you just have to say, this is what we're going to do. So how do we do it differently in order to make it happen? Um, and I think that um, forums like this, I think that, that there's a lot of leaders. You've got three of them that, that are on the panel with me today that have chosen ways to engage. Um, there are more people that, that need to step up and engage in that same manner within that sphere, um, whether it's the government, whether it's a CEO, right. whether it's the community, um, and, and move forward. And we have to put people to work. There are jobs out there. We need to remove the barriers. People want to work, get them in the jobs, um, and go to them to see what else they need. Are they hungry? Are they ill? Is their child ill? Do they not have eyeglasses? Whatever it is, um, don't don't fool yourself that they're going to be able to navigate through what's available and figure it out on their own. And it's not that hard to go to people. It really isn't. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll echo again um, with where do we start? Of course, it's it's safety and keeping people healthy. And you know, much of my department's work around uh, MIOSHA, um, around small business relief, around uh, the emergency benefits that we're providing people are to try to help you know, not have them be put in a position where they have to make bad choices mm -hmm. or worse choices around their health. Um, so we're gonna continue to do that. I think what we're also worried about here um, is exactly what I think the Reverend talked about, which is the number of small businesses, particularly businesses in communities of color that are at risk right now of not surviving the winter. Um, you know, we're talking about this as even like, a, how do we help people get through the hibernation period that we're about to go in when patios are closed, when um, you know, people are gonna be staying inside more often? Um, what does that look like? And you know, we have, 
what I tell my team and what I ask my team to, to take as something to heart is that we do not corner the market on good ideas. We have to go out and talk to people in the community about what helps them, what's going to keep them afloat and allow them to, um, you know, have some own, uh, their own uh, ideas and entrepreneurial, uh, you know, activities to be able to, to keep uh, in business here. So we're going to keep trying to pursue that um, now and through the next few months. But then I think it's looking at recovery and continuing as Cindy and Jerry have both right. said, getting people jobs, removing those barriers to jobs, because certainly just putting a, an application or a, um, you know, a job uh, posting out there for someone is, is a good thing, but so many people need to have other supports to be able to, to actually get that job and keep that job. And so it's on us to make sure we identify what those barriers are and how it is that we can uh, keep knocking them down. All right, uh, Reverend Ken Lott, final comments? One of the things I would want to leave as a lasting thought is for those that are watching and will uh, engage later on, is just remembering never think too little of what you can do. Uh, one of the things that I've often pushed uh, in our uh, faith and within the realm of our discussions uh, with our church is remembering this, uh, stop waiting on a black knight on a white horse to ride in. Uh, with the solutions to the problem. All of us have got to get engaged and we all got to take an active part in the reforms that we want to see happen in our community. Uh, we got to push reforms economically. Uh, Senator Booker has a bill, the uh, baby uh, bonds. Uh, we we got to push uh, $15 an hour. We have to push um, right. uh, reparations. We right. need to stop talking about uh, the reparations is it, it's just the way it's defined. It's the terms that have been badly described. Talking about, it mean, just means to repair. Uh, we're just talking about equality and equity. We got to start talking about educationally. Everybody got to do their part. When we saw uh, DPS uh, struggling with digital divides before uh, it became a conversation, Triumph Church went out and bought 10,000 uh, digital tablets and say, listen, um, we know uh, that we got a campaign coming, but we're going to make sure that we do our part uh, until that help shows up uh, because we're moving to a digital online uh, teaching model with our young people. We got to make sure that uh, the teachers that we put in front of them are qualified and prepared to give our kids the kind of environment they need to soar. Uh, we got to still continue to have conversation of corporate and social responsibility. That's why I'm glad to talk uh, with these leaders today about what does diversity look like in the boardroom? What does diversity look like with community liaison? Uh, making sure uh, that we have uh, people who have relationships with the community, not just individuals, but with the community to make sure uh, that uh, you're getting the best mile for every dollar that you are choosing to spend in the community. Protecting our small businesses, making sure that we got affordable uh, health care, but also making sure that we got access to quality health care. We got to continue to fight uh, for water being a human right, a human right. Uh, and we got to make sure that not only uh, are we uh, making sure that people can get a home, we got to make sure that we have resources in order uh, to make sure people can stay in their home. And so all of us collectively got to use whatever platform and vehicle we need and we have at our disposal and discretion to make sure that we participate in, in this conversation and in the solution. All right, so I don't wanna take much of your time because you all have very busy schedules in this time, but I wanna um, uh, make a quick request of you. If we could do another hour of this sometime next month, um, because I wanna really zero in on this model of leadership. I think we've touched on something here and I wanna stay with this panel. I like this panel. Um, I want to stay with this panel. If we can do an hour next month on the model of leadership in COVID-19, and I will circle back with your offices to, you know, to lock down a date. But I wanna also want to say this. So we had some technical issues at the start. As you know, this is, this is new technology for all of us. <laughs> it's different when we would walk into the colony club and, you know, the stage is set and everybody's seated, you know, all of that stuff. So it's new technology. So for those who could not join us, because we got a lot of folks who were signed in, but they were able to watch it on different pages. We're going to send out an e-blast out to them right after this, right after the forum. And also, I'm going to rebroadcast this entire conversation 
on my radio show at 11 o'clock. So our listeners in Ohio, Detroit, across the region, around the nation will be listening to this and will get listener reactions. So when we do the next forum next month, I will weave in their comments uh, to, to, to all of you. So thank you so much uh, for being here. On behalf of the Pulse Institute, it was an honor uh, uh, to, to, to continue to really engage uh, this kind of dialogue, this kind of conversation about what matters in Detroit when it comes to inequality, poverty, COVID-19, and you know it. So thanks again for being here. Thank you, Bankley. Thank you, thanks, everyone. Bankley. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.